A murder without a motive. A killer the prosecution said was so twisted, he hatched the ultimate role play with fantasy gamers. They told us how many times she was stabbed. I knew immediately. 55 stab wounds, the knife left in her neck. And they said, we think it's her husband. Mr. Faria. Just like that, everything came together. Yeah, I'll give you why. I thought that's the only person it could be. The victim was already dying. We found out in October of 2011 that the breast cancer had gone to her liver. I thought, oh my gosh, that's a death sentence. The husband now serving his own sentence, life in prison. I was pleased with the outcome and think that justice was served. This may not be an open and shut case. The case is under appeal and the prosecution is not talking. As we look into questions about the Faria case that never came up in trial. Welcome to our special report, the Faria murder. A joint investigation combining the resources of Fox 2 and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We began this investigation more than two months ago after a jury convicted husband Russ Faria for murdering his wife Betsy. We've examined evidence as we've looked into nagging questions you'll see unfold for the first time. Lincoln County 911. Two days after Christmas, 2011. Russ Faria called 911, said he thought his wife Betsy killed herself. I don't, I wish she do this to me. A medical examiner said she was stabbed 55 times, her arms nearly severed, most of the stabbings after she was dead. A crime of passion. When you stab somebody over 50 times, it's usually a crime of passion, a husband or wife. I felt right away it was, his, it was Russ. The immediate suspect, the husband, Russ Faria. For the first time, you're hearing and seeing evidence like the 911 tape and interrogations. You no. have been stabbed over 25 times. Oh my God, no, 25 times. Over 25 times. And they're not done yet, they're still old. They're still counting. The major case squad questioned him for days. God is in this room with us right now. And God knows that I did not do this. He did not back down. I did not do this. I did not do it. In our joint investigation with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, Robert Patrick and I interviewed Russ Faria in prison. It's less than three months after a jury convicted him. Did you kill Betsy? No, no, I didn't. You know, I loved her. I would never and could never do anything like that to anybody, let alone somebody that I love. Evidence techs did not find a drop of blood on him. Police did find these bloody slippers in a closet and a light switch that appeared to be flipped with something bloody. How do you explain bloody slippers? Well, um, judging by the way that they looked, you know, it appeared to me that they looked like they were dipped. Only those slippers and no bloody footprints. I hadn't even been wearing my slippers. And then I'm told that they were in my closet, which I never put them in my closet. Defense attorney Joel Schwartz added they found no evidence of cleanup. They took the pipes to look for blood. There was no evidence of a shower that night. There was no evidence of blood anywhere in the shower or in the drain pipes. In trial, the state focused on Faria's demeanor. Lincoln County Prosecutor Leah Askey told jurors he never needed a Kleenex. We also asked Faria why he appeared emotionless during our prison interview. Well, I've put a lot of things behind me. I've made peace with a lot of things. I've shed a lot of tears. When she was diagnosed both times with cancer, um, you know, I loved her. I love her still, you know, I didn't kill her. Four alibi witnesses said Russ was with them from 6 to 9 p.m. in O'Fallon, Missouri. The drive from their house to Troy puts Faria home within minutes of him making the 911 call. A call Betsy's family believes is telling. Your wife is laying there dead. I mean, you, you'd be bawling. You'd be hard to communicate with. I mean, he would stop. I mean, sh she'd ask him a question, and he'd stop, answer it, and then start right back up with this wailing. How could he think it was suicide? She had threatened it previously. She had actually tried it previously, you know, left notes and that. Um, my mind wasn't working right. You know, I saw slashes on her arms, and... I jumped to conclusions. He said he knew police would focus on him. He's the husband, 
But even sitting in prison, after a jury convicted him and a judge sentenced him to life, he says he would not change how he handled it. Schwartz said Faria would not take time served on a misdemeanor. Really? Yeah. He didn't kill his wife. Schwartz said he told prosecutors they had a case, but not against Russ. Our counter was, uh, appoint me as a special prosecutor and let me prosecute the right person, and I'll guarantee you a conviction. This is where the case takes a twist as we reveal suppressed evidence. St. Louis Post-Dispatch reporter Robert Patrick joins me now. He worked with me on this investigation and published this front page story in Sunday's paper. In trial, Russ's motive for murder did not come out, but Betsy's family believes he did have motive. Betsy's sister told me that she believes Russ found out that Betsy was making life insurance plans. Tell me about some of these plans that she was making. Well, one of Betsy's friends told me that she was very reluctant to accept her fatal cancer diagnosis, but eventually came around to, to understand that she was going to have to make videos, going to have to say goodbye to people. She was planning on making some videos to say, say things to her her daughters during milestones of their lives and also parcel out the proceeds of her life insurance at those same milestones you know x thousand dollars when when one graduates from college you know ten thousand here to buy a car that sort of thing and in these conversations did anything come up about a fear of russ no nobody that i ever spoke to said that that betsy was afraid of russ i mean they 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 fought their relationship was up and down but no one said to me um that she was afraid of him. So the insurance proceeds was more about leaving a lasting legacy, that the money would be used for a positive, lasting memory. Right, right. Some people have told me that she was afraid that Russ would be too distraught to spend the money wisely or fail to spend the money wisely, and that's why she gave somebody else the, the responsibility. And you asked Russ in our prison interview about whether he knew about any change in beneficiary, and here's that clip. Why was she changing insurance beneficiaries at that point? I have no idea. I didn't even know until after I was arrested that that had happened. Betsy's family and closest friends were also surprised about the life insurance change. Was there any evidence that uh, Russ did find a change in a policy? I don't believe that the police found any evidence in the house of the insurance policy. And in fact, um, I don't think anybody was really initially clear on, on who was the beneficiary of that policy. And there's a bigger reason why this life insurance did not come up in trial. It would open the door for evidence we're about to show you. What the timeline revealed about Betsy Faria's murder, including evidence kept from the jury and a surprise phone call to a juror right after the guilty verdict. We will continue our special report, The Faria Murder, a woman who seemingly had no enemies. I don't think she ever knew a stranger, which is really hard to accept this because everybody loved Betsy. You did not go anywhere with her and not have a good time. The murder of a dying woman first looked like a simple case. The husband claimed he found her dead, calling it suicide. But his wife was stabbed 55 times. Prosecutors convinced a judge to keep some evidence from jurors. But it's all in the court record. Betsy Faria was dying. Her friend Kathleen Meyer said Betsy had just come to terms with it and was content. Her family would get a life insurance payout. Policies that will take care of my husband and my daughters. She said, so when, I'm, when I die, they will be well taken care of. That was Betsy, always thinking of others, even hoping to raise money for another family battling cancer. And so this was gonna be a legacy for her to leave um, something like this behind in her memory. She remembers Betsy being ecstatic. They'd raised a lot of money. I don't know how they collected the $10,000 she said they collected, but they weren't a for, they weren't an organization that could give a tax reimbursement yet. Kathleen says Pam Hupp, Betsy's friend, went door to door with Betsy, passing out this flyer in December, just weeks before Betsy died. This is where our timeline begins. Court records show on December 23rd, four days before the murder, Pam and Betsy went to the Winghaven Library together. There, they had a librarian witness them signing a change of beneficiary form for Betsy's life insurance policy. The new beneficiary for that $150,000 policy, Pam Hupp. It didn't make any sense to me at all. I had no knowledge of this um, until the insurance company was investigating the payout. 
According to records from State Farm, less than a month after the murder, a detective gave the go-ahead to the insurance company, saying, Mr. Faria is currently in custody. Months later, that same detective appeared friendly in this follow-up interview with Hupp. You now have this money and have not turned any of this money over to the family or the kids. That's correct. That's a huge problem. Betsy has told you that she wants you to hold on to this money to make sure that the family, the, the girls are taken care of, yet they haven't seen a dime of that money. You still have it. The detective asked again about the day of the murder, December 27th, 2011. Betsy was with her friend Bobby Wan at Betsy's chemo that afternoon. Court records indicate Betsy texted Huff to tell her she didn't need a ride, she was with an old friend, and texted, had not spent any one-on-one -on -one with her. But Huff suddenly showed up at this chemo treatment. Betsy's friend said she was surprised and Hupp took Betsy home later that night. Then, just hours before the murder, Betsy texted Russ, Pam Hupp wants to bring me home to bed. Pam told the court she drove Betsy from Lake St. Louis to Troy, arriving after 7 p.m. According to court records, Betsy's daughter called to tell her mom she'd need to pick up her phone soon to authorize a family plan cell phone. Betsy did not pick up, not at 721, 726, or 730. Hupp told police she was gone by then. Listen on this audio tape recorded the morning after the murder. We called my husband when we got there. And you called him for what reason? To tell him we were there. He wanted to know when I was, I don't really drive at night too much. Did you go inside? Uh, no. First, she said no. Then a major case squad investigator asked again. So did you ever go, actually go inside the house? I did. Well, we just went in. She turned on the hall light. Police asked about another call Hupp made to Betsy at 7.27 p.m. You called her when you got home? I'm trying to think which one I called. I called Betsy to tell her I was home. Home is O'Fallon, Missouri. Cell phone records show that 7.27 call pinged north of Troy in this area of the Faria home. I talked to Hupp at her house right after the trial. I asked her if she remembered hearing Betsy's phone ring when her daughter was calling. Betsy doesn't not pick up many calls. Right, so I was just wondering why she didn't pick up those. That I can't answer. Maybe either we were in her bedroom then. I don't know. I don't know where her phone was. I never even heard any calls. I don't know if I left right before she got a call. I don't know. Like I told them, I wasn't expecting for police to come to my door that next morning. So I wasn't taking notes. Go back. She also sounded uncertain during this videotaped re-interview about how she left Betsy. I think originally you told investigators that when you left, Betsy was laying on the couch. <laughs> Is that correct? I know she was on the couch because she was put, she was going to put in a movie. She was going to watch a movie. It happened really fast. Mm -hmm. All that happened really fast. And used to her walking to me door. Maybe sure. not. But I want to say today she did. But okay. Maybe she still was on the couch. Okay. She was often on the couch. The only female DNA found at the scene was Betsy's. DNA testing revealed Betsy's blood on the murder weapon. The DNA lab report continues. Russell Faria is excluded as the source of these profiles. Blood on the light switch came back, a mixture of at least two individuals, at least one of which is male. The report continues that it's Betsy's blood, but that Russell Faria is excluded as the major contributor. Minor contributors are weak and incomplete. When talking to Hupp at her door, she told me the major case squad did not seize much from her, except this list of clothing she told detectives she was wearing. And they took the clothing you said you wore. Right. And then they, they looked at, they did they look at the car? Um, I don't know if they did or not. It was outside. I mean, it was parked right in my driveway. Did they spray luminol on your car or your husband's car? No. After this interview with Hupp, I just want your initial thoughts. We found the family on the flyer Hupp reportedly handed out. Wow, that's our Christmas card. Whew, that's, that's really, it's kind of scary. James Murphy is the man in that flyer, seeing for the first time his Christmas card, photocopy, he says, without his permission. I have no idea where she came up with some of this stuff. We found Murphy while following a lead apparently overlooked by investigators. To me, in my world, $150,000 not that much. Court records show that Hupp claimed she did not need money and even once gave fifty grand to a family battling cancer. This interview may be the first time anyone's followed up. It never got back to you. Nobody ever said, hey, what's... I'm really surprised that um, that we haven't been. I mean, it's uh, doing something like this. Um, it's, it's taking a big chance, I would think.
that somebody didn't con contact us. He says the story is not true. In this line, Laura's last Christmas. She still had time. She still had time. Um, she was sick, but no, it's this, I have no idea why she would say this is Laura's last Christmas. So if you had seen that at the time, that would hurt. It would, it would really would. She had two Christmases. His wife died a year and a half later. James Murphy said Hupp regularly took his wife out while she underwent chemo, but never said anything about a fundraiser, and he never saw a dime. To make a case against Russ Faria, prosecutors made surprising new allegations and closing statements. They convinced a jury this was an evil plan, plotted by five people playing a fantasy role-play game. You'll hear from all four of the fantasy game players who are now challenging prosecutors and police. Come and get them if prosecutors really believe they're not telling the truth about the night of the murder. We're not going to let our friend go away up the river for something he didn't do, not without yelling and screaming about it. A Lincoln County jury convicted Russ Faria for stabbing his wife 55 times and leaving a steak knife buried in her neck. The reason? Prosecutors say it was the ultimate role play drawn up years earlier by a group of gamers. Every one of those gamers have now come forward challenging prosecutors. Set an innocent man free or come after them. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, from uh, reading uh, the stories in the newspaper, from seeing the stuff online, hearing things on the news, it was pretty damning. Since Russ Faria's arrest in 2011, these four people yeah, thought they could have been sitting right like next that. to a murderer. All you're hearing is, uh, and we were hearing from investigators, open and shut case. This Michael Corbin, Angelia Hewley, and Brandon Sweeney and Marshall Bach all told detectives they were with Russ Faria from 6 to 9 p.m. the night Betsy was murdered. For the longest time, like I even said, uh, I thought Russ did it before he came out and hung out with us. Then they learned at trial, prosecutors narrowed Betsy's time of death to a time between 7.20 and 9.41 p.m. Even convict Russ Faria's attorney says he did not know prosecutors would suddenly accuse cooperating witnesses. The state alleged that four innocent people conspired in murder. If these people aren't innocent, then why aren't they charged? Uh, bigger question is why won't the state go on record and say that to you? Because there's nothing to support it just like there's nothing to support that Russell Free had anything to do with this. In closing arguments at trial, Lincoln County Prosecutor Leah Askey called Betsy's murder the ultimate role play. Askey told jurors Russ Faria brought a murder plot to his friends. She said they all set up the alibi, using Brandon Sweeney to play a key role. Askey suggested Sweeney kept Russ's cell phone so that it would ping in O'Fallon at 8.57 p.m. She said Sweeney then drove through the Arby's to get this receipt stamped 909 so that Russ could kill his wife 30 minutes away. That really sickens my stomach because I tried to help him the whole time, uh, be honest and truthful, tr just trying to find what happened that night, to be honest with you. If we're guilty of something, we should be arrested. Leah Askey, probably in particular, is not going to like what we're doing here. But we don't want to be here. It made me sick. <laughs> it really did. I just, I, I just can't believe it. I just, I didn't think things like that happened. Faith in the justice system and authority figures, there is no faith in them anymore. You see something like this happen, I don't know, you, know, you almost go around town wondering like, who's gonna try to screw me over? It almost makes you second guess working with authorities. I don't wanna be having to talk to you as nice as a guy as you are, Chris, but Leah Askey put us here by saying that our friend committed a crime that he could not possibly have committed. I mean, he was within eight foot of us that night. There is no way he committed this crime. Police report finding no blood on Russ Faria. A crime lab report shows DNA testing revealed Betsy's blood on the murder weapon. The DNA lab report continues. Russell Faria is excluded as the source of these profiles. I made repeated attempts to get answers from Prosecutor Askey, even writing the Attorney General's office, which assisted in convicting Russ Faria. Askey finally responded with this email. I cannot comment on anything regarding this case until all of the defendant's appeals have been exhausted. I have stated this every way possible on numerous occasions. I appreciate your zeal. However, this will serve as my answer to all such questions and future inquiries. This is just the beginning of our co-investigation with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Robert, tell me about this phone call a juror received right after the verdict. Well, one of the jurors was on his way home from the trial, and he got a call from a friend of his who said, let me tell you, that guy's innocent. Who was this, and what was that about? 
She's an employee in the courthouse. She sat through part of the trial, and as he described it to me, she saw what the jurors weren't allowed to see. And what was he thinking when he heard this from this woman? I think it kind of blew him away, and, and I think he's been thinking about it a lot. He's, um, it's, it's brought up some issues that he has with the justice system. He's sort of hoping that they got the right guy, but he's also glad that there's an appeal, and he's glad that somebody's looking into it. Tell me about the first vote coming out of closing statements. Yeah, as soon as the jurors went back, they voted, and it was 6-6. And what changed that? About four hours of talking. You know, they did discuss another suspect, um, somebody that, that it, it was clear to jurors that, um, that Russ's lawyer was pointing at somebody else. They discussed that person, um, and one of the jurors told me that he essentially talked them out of it. What was it that made them feel good about their final decision? Well, the three jurors that I was able to reach and talk to all didn't believe his alibi. They also mentioned the fact that 55 stab wounds indicates rage. I said, there's rage there. A lot of the jurors couldn't get past the bloody slippers, and they couldn't get past what police said was, a, was some indication that there was a trail of blood leading to a kitchen drawer. What did one of the jurors say about an appeal and how that weighed in on their decision? Well, one of the jurors said that they knew there was going to be an appeal, and that eased their minds somewhat in coming to a final decision that, they, that, that, that essentially would be reviewed. So what happens next? Who will play the key role in fighting the appeal as our Fox 2 St. Louis Post-Dispatch investigation continues? I know that I'm innocent. Um, Mr. Schwartz has told me, you know, he knows in his, in his mind and in his heart that I'm innocent. Russ Free as attorney filed an appeal. We asked the Attorney General's office to comment because an assistant AG helped in prosecution. The office declined to comment and will handle the appeal. Thanks for joining us in our Fox 2 St. Louis Post-Dispatch joint investigation. Keep the conversation going on Twitter using the hashtag FreeAMurder and count on us for new developments. Everybody there wanted to make the right decision. There was no one there that was like, oh, the hell with you guys, this is, you know, he's guilty. Everybody was willing to listen to everybody else. Ken Masterson and Debbie Bray agree they should have been able to hear everything. You got someone's life in your hands and you want to make sure that you're making the right decision. Husband Russ Faria called reporting a suicide. A medical examiner said his wife Betsy was stabbed 55 times, her arms nearly severed. Evidence text did not find a drop of blood on the husband. Police did find bloody slippers tossed in a closet and a light switch that appeared to be swiped with something bloody. Then when we find out later things that we didn't get to hear, it, it's upsetting. I was very upset about it. Both jurors later learned a judge suppressed evidence of murder victim Betsy Faria's life insurance and how the woman who drove Betsy home the night of the murder benefited from a $150,000 policy that was just signed into her name. My whole life I've heard the phrase the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, that's leaving out some of the truth. This isn't, you know, does somebody pay a $30 fine or five days in jail? This is life in prison. You need to know everything. Jurors began deliberations with a split vote, six to six. Then it was 10 to two guilty, with Debbie Bray holding out. I didn't think there was enough evidence to convict like how we were supposed to, but we did a lot of kind of filling in the blanks. As the blanks were being filled in, my mind was starting to change. One of those blanks, she said prosecutors avoided talking about when they thought Betsy Faria died. Which was strange. They couldn't give us an exact um, time of death. They couldn't even really give us kind of a, a roundabout. During a pretrial hearing, the defense asked the prosecution to narrow down the time of death. An assistant attorney general who helped prosecute said they could not. He admitted that would, quote, literally be making it up. He told the judge, this is something for the jury to decide. So jurors came up with their own theory. They thought maybe Russ left his phone in a mailbox in Lake St. Louis so his phone would ping away from the murder. He could have left it there went back because there, there was plenty of time. Masterson added that the alibi witnesses did not help Russ. The stories were a little bit too good, a little bit too rehearsed. It was 4.08 p.m. when I looked at my clock and 
The alibi witnesses testified they were watching movies with Russ from 6 to 9 p.m. the night of the murder. All four of them interviewed in our studios after trial. I don't know what to say, except for that when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember a whole lot. They described it as a boring night, burned into their minds after police knocked on their doors. Now these jurors are experiencing similar twists with what they've learned after their verdict. Bray says she will never forget how she felt hearing the judge read guilty. I felt sick, and then it made me kind of feel did we do the right thing here? At that moment, she felt the answer was still yes. They made the right decision. Now she hopes someone will continue investigating. I hope he can get an appeal. I hope that justice happens. <laughs> Russ Faria began by sobbing. What is the address where you need this to come? One, one, one. Former 911 operator Tammy Vaughn picked up the call. My wife killed herself. She's, she's, she's on the floor. She immediately knew it might be her toughest. I could hardly take the call because I looked over at my supervisor and I did one of those, I don't know if I can do this. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, just take a couple deep breaths for me. She continued the entire 10 minute call. She did what she says she's trained to do. Get Faria to answer questions about his dead wife, Betsy. Russell, how long were you gone today? I, I, I left around five. And I just got back. But she was at her mom's and her friend was bringing her home, so I don't know, know what time she got home. In court, a 911 supervisor testified it was unusual the way Faria went in and out of hysteria. The defense objected, but the judge overruled it. And the jury was led to believe that even 911 operators thought the call was odd. But the prosecution never called the operator who took the call, Tammy Vaughn, who says she never questioned it. You can't fake that. You can't fake that emotion. In my, in my personal opinion, you can't. Um, are there people out there that can do it? I don't know, because I've, all the calls that I've taken have been true hysterical callers. Vaughn says 911 operators are expected to get hysterical callers to answer questions. It's a redirection. It's a technique that communicators use to try to redirect, calm them down, ask them the question, and then whenever they have to focus back on the victim or the patient or the person that is, that's there that's needing the help, then, then they do what's called a re-freak. It happened repeatedly on the Faria call. Has she been depressed lately? <laughs> she's got, she's got, she's got, she's got cancer. I need you to get those medications for the paramedics, okay? Uh, I think they're here on the table. Then in another twist, Vaughn discovered something the following week. I later on learned that I knew them. At the time that I took the call, I had no idea who it was. And then later on, I realized that, you know, it was, you know, a couple that I went to church with. She can now see them standing side by side in her mind. And she cannot forget one particular phrase she heard during Russ Faria's call. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? When she heard that, she thought she might not last. But she held on with him until police arrived. New at 10, $150,000 is on the line. The question tonight, whose money is it? Was the money intended for the friend of a murder victim or the dead woman's daughters? Fox Files investigator Chris Hayes has the latest chapter in the Faria Files. It's a twist revealed in a civil lawsuit. The adult daughters of murder victim Betsy Faria are suing to get the proceeds from their mom's life insurance policy. Pam Hupp has that $150,000 because the policy was signed over into her name just days before the murder. Here's Hupp's testimony um, from July time, in this civil court video deposition obtained I by the Fox Files. I had a lot of pressure on me from the detectives and the attorney general and the whole side that was representing Betsy to form a trust for the girls. Pam Hupp drove Betsy Faria home the night Faria was murdered, December 27th, 2011. Major K-Squad detectives recorded this interview with Hupp the next morning. Listen to Hupp explain why the murder victim signed said, over her life insurance. Um, I'm going to make you the beneficiary if you could, when my daughters are older, give them some money. I want my kids to have it. Now Hupp's changed her story. She didn't want her daughters to have the money. She didn't want her mom to have the money, her sisters to have the money. So it was your impression that she wanted you to have the money. Is that right? That's correct. 
Hupp said she only made it look like Faria's girls would get the money by setting up a trust. Police asking me if I did it, I should do it, it would help their case. Detective Carrick told me, you can do what you want with it, it's yours, but we would like for you to set up a trust for the girls. It's and a revocable trust, so I just revoked it. How did you do I revoked the funds. It was my money. Hupp told police and testified at the Faria murder trial to Assistant Attorney General Richard Hicks' question. Betsy's purpose was to try to assure that the money got to the girls? Hupp testified, that's correct. She described putting 100 grand in a trust for the girls and the remaining 50,000, Hupp testified, my other girlfriend died of breast cancer and she has a 12-year-old daughter that I'm trying to help. The assistant AG asked, are you using the money for that? Hupp testified, yes. Now listen to Hupp's story today. Did you tell anyone, uh, Mrs. Hupp, that you gave $50,000 of these insurance proceeds uh, to a family who had a family member suffering from cancer? No. You never told anyone that? I told them I was contemplating that. I can't tell you why. I can't tell you on any of my accounts why I do what I do. At that time, it makes sense, so I do it. Seven months after the murder, Hupp told the chief detective she did not need Betsy's money. My mom's worth a half a million that I get when she dies. Her mom died three months later. Um, Hupp now disputes that she got half a million. It wasn't 500000 no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No. Get Every out of my way, man. That's the voice of Pam's husband, Mark Hupp. We're outside a civil court hearing where Betsy Faria's daughters are suing to get their mom's life insurance proceeds. A judge froze the Hupp's bank accounts during the proceedings. Off camera, Pam Hupp told me it's not fair and her husband's countersuing the daughters because of it. I have every right to be here. I'm not, so do I. Hupp also told me she cannot access money she gets for her disability, $800 a month for her neck, back, and legs. Here outside of court, she did not talk. She ran and ran. The attorneys did not respond to requests for comment, and the civil attorneys David Bush and Chris Roberts also, who are suing Hupp, also did not comment. In fact, that was their videotape, but that, they are not the source of that tape. So where does the civil case stand now? Right now they're waiting on a trial date. It was supposed to go to trial last month, and Hupp asked for a new judge. She's going to get it. We're just waiting on a new date. All right. Well, keep us informed, Chris. Thanks so much. <laughs> Pam Hupp was the beneficiary of a $150,000 life insurance policy paid out after the stabbing death of Betsy Faria. A Lincoln County judge did not allow a jury to hear about Hupp's financial windfall or the fact that Faria's life insurance policy was signed over into Hupp's name just days before the murder. A jury then convicted Faria's husband, Russ. In the court record, Hupp first claimed she was made beneficiary to help Betsy's daughter. Now Hupp is changing her story, saying in this newly filed temporary restraining order, the money belongs to her. Now another judge is stepping in. A St. Charles County judge just granted this temporary restraining order against Pam Hupp or anyone acting on her behalf. They're prohibited from removing funds from their bank accounts or selling their O'Fallon, Missouri home. Here's a timeline that explains why. The morning after Betsy Faria was murdered, Major Case Squad investigators interviewed Pam Hupp. Hupp drove Faria home that night of the murder, December 27, 2011. In a recorded interview, she explained to police why the victim had changed her life insurance policy. She goes, would you be my beneficiary on my life policies and make sure my kids get when they need it? I said, okay. All right. Months later, the chief detective uh, working Betsy Faria's murder warned Hupp. The insurance policy. Insurance policy. Huge in this case, obviously. Um, the biggest doubt that they're going to try to create is that you, a week prior to her murder, wind up in being the benefactor of $150,000 in cash. Mm -hmm. um, what you originally tell investigators is, is that she wanted you to do this to try to take care of, make sure the kids are taken care of because they're afraid Russ, she's afraid Russ and the kids will blow through it. However, you now have this money mm -hmm. and have not turned any of this money over to the family or the kids. That's correct. That's a huge problem. Faria's kids, Mariah and Leah Day, are still trying to get that money. They hired lawyers who document Hupp spending thousands, including $180,000 in cash to buy Hupp's current O'Fallon home. Civil court filings reveal Hupp did set up a trust last November 13th, just three days before Russ Faria's trial for murder. According to court records, Hupp said she set up the trust, quote, because I felt I was pressured to fill that account with that money from the prosecuting side. 
Court documents then reveal Hupp removed 99700 from that trust on December 10, 2013, just weeks after a jury convicted Russ Faria of murder. Meanwhile, Hupp told Fox 2 the following week that the girl's money was still in that trust. As far as like the insurance money and stuff like that, that's in a trust and they know it for the girls. The daughter's attorneys appear to be getting a much different story from Hupp. In a deposition last month, they asked her, did Faria mention to you that she wanted the money to be used for her daughters? Hupp responded, absolutely not. She went on to say, it was my money. The daughter's attorneys David Bush and Christopher Roberts had no comment about the restraining order, a document that also addresses an additional 50000 from Betsy Faria's life insurance. On the stand during the Faria trial, Pam Hupp testified she gave the fifty grand to a friend with cancer. She's now telling Betsy Faria's daughters she did not give the cancer victim that money, that she was only thinking about it. For the Fox Files, I'm Chris Hayes. Well, new at 10 is the wrong man behind bars for murder. The attorney for Russ Faria says he's about to file an appeal. Our recent Fox Files exclusive showed a key witness changing her story. Now only Fox Files investigator Chris Hayes reveals what it might mean. Every day that this man spends in jail uh, is a travesty of justice. He's an innocent man confined in prison right now. Joel Schwartz is the defense attorney for Russ Faria. A Lincoln County jury sentenced Faria to life in prison for the stabbing death of his wife, Betsy. The jury didn't get the opportunity to view what the public has now seen. And I can't imagine, given the fact that this man had four alibi witnesses, in addition to three alibi videotapes, two alibi receipts, and his cell phone all confirmed he was 45 minutes away at the time of death, that anyone could possibly imagine he did it. Now we're hearing more about the changing stories from Betsy Faria's friend, Pam Hupp, the designated beneficiary of Betsy's $150,000 life insurance policy. That policy was signed over to Hupp days before the murder. Detectives asked Hupp about it. Listen to what she said Betsy told her was the reason. I want my kids to have it. Daughters Leah and Mariah never got the money, so they're suing. And now Hupp says... It was my money. Hupp drove Betsy Faria home the night she was killed. Lincoln County Judge Chris Kunza Minnemeyer barred a jury from hearing about the money. The judge ruled it was not relevant. Before the trial, police told Hupp why it was a problem for their case against Russ. You now have this money and have not turned any of this money over to the family or the kids. That's correct. That's a huge problem. Betsy has told you that she wants you to hold on to this money to make sure that the family, the, the girls are taken care of. Yet they haven't seen a dime of that money. You still have it. Just before trial, Hupp said she put two-thirds of the money into a trust for the girls, after pressure from the prosecutor and the Missouri Attorney General's office. The pressure was to make the case look better against Russ, frankly, because there was no evidence against him. Hupp told police and testified at the Faria murder trial to Assistant Attorney General Richard Hicks' question. Betsy's purpose was to try to assure that the money got to the girls? Hupp testified, that's correct. She described putting 100 grand in a trust for the girls and the remaining 50,000, Hupp testified, my other girlfriend died of breast cancer and she has a 12-year-old daughter that I'm trying to help. The assistant AG asked, are you using the money for that? Hupp testified, yes. Now listen to Hupp's story today. Did you tell anyone, uh, Mrs. Hupp, that you gave $50,000 of these insurance proceeds uh, to a family who had a family member suffering from cancer? No. You never told anyone that? I told them I was contemplating that. The inconsistencies do not surprise Attorney Schwartz, who says he's hoping a new jury will finally hear it. The appeal is virtually done and we should be filing it within the next couple of weeks. He says he does not believe the prosecutor will look into Hupp's changing story. It's clearly out there and if the prosecutor hasn't been following this, she's covering her ears and closing her eyes. It's there, and if she chooses to do so, she can, and frankly, she should. Lincoln County Prosecutor Leah Askey emailed this short response. According to state statute, I haven't seen any evidence of perjury as it pertains to my case. Please let me know if you have specific examples that I might have missed. Askey says she not only believes in her case, but says the right man is behind bars. She told me that history will show she was on the right side. Chris, uh, when might we hear an answer about the appeal and any response from the Attorney General's office? Anytime. It's hard to say, but probably next year before we hear, and I've kept the Attorney General's office up to date and heard absolutely nothing. Mm. All right. Chris, Chris thanks thank so you. much.